Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day of worship. We bless your name because you have called us together. We thank you for your love manifested through Jesus Christ in sending him to this world to die for us so that as we believe in him, we will not perish but have everlasting life. We thank you because you spoke to our hearts and you helped us by the Holy Spirit to turn away from our sins and also to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you because of the peace we have. Thank you because of the redemption. Thank you because there is no condemnation now. Because we live in Christ, we live by the Spirit, and we walk not in the flesh. Father, we pray that as we have come into the kingdom of God, you will help us so that we continue to live to your glory in Jesus' name. Lord, as we have come into the kingdom of God, and we are called by your name, we want to live to your glory. We want to live to please you. We want to live to obey your word. Therefore, Father, we are praying. You will grant us the grace. We pray, O oh Lord, you grant us the supernatural strength so that we will always do what is pleasing in your sight in Jesus' name. Make us sensitive to your voice, sensitive to the touch of the Holy Spirit, sensitive to the warning of the Holy Spirit, sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit, so that every time, in the day and in the night, when we are with people or when we are alone, we will know what you demand of us, what you want us to do, how you want us to live. Father, we pray that as we look at your word today, we will hear your very word coming clearly onto our hearts. Father, we pray that you will speak to us as Father, telling us what you demand of us, your children. And Lord, we pray there will be that love, that desire, that interest, that decision from within us that will want to follow you every moment of the day and also every period of our life. Guide us, O oh Lord. Speak to us in your word and grant us the enablement that, Lord, will not fail, will not fall, will follow after you. In Jesus' name we pray. We bless the name of the Lord who has brought us together today to worship the Lord and also to listen to his word, to know from his word, to know by his spirit what he requires of us, so that for the rest of our lives we will live lives that are glorifying unto him. It's a wonderful thing to come into this world and to find the creator of the whole world related to us by turning away from sin, turning away from Satan, turning away from self, turning away from the world, turning away from every work of darkness, and embracing Jesus as our Lord and Savior. It's a wonderful thing to know that we belong to the Lord. It is not enough to just be born into this world with the nature of sin, with the habit of sin, doing things that are displeasing unto God. But what a wonderful thing, wonderful experience it is to know that we belong to the Lord. We belong to the family of God. We have been washed. We have been cleansed. We have been brought into reconciliation with God himself. And it will be the joy of your heart, if you have known the Lord, to know what is the requirement of God, the demand of God, the desire of God for your own life, so that you will be able to do what pleases the Lord. That's why today I'm talking to you from the word of God on the subject God demands for holiness. The demand of God for holiness in our lives. God demands for holiness. It is so important that we know what God really expects of us. That he demands for holiness. He delights in holiness. He desires holiness in our lives. There are people that come into the family of God and they profess to be born again. They profess to be the children of God, and yet, do you know, they do not know that this is the deep desire of God, the unchanging desire of God, the uninterrupted desire of God, the permanent, purposeful desire of God for the life of every child of God, that every child of God should be holy in his sight. Let's look at First Peter, chapter 1, from verse 14. 
First Peter chapter 1 from verse 14. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former laws in your ignorance. It tells us that before we came to the Lord, we were in ignorance. We were in darkness. We didn't know what would make God happy. We didn't know what God delighted in. We didn't know what, what would bring joy to the heart of our Father God. We didn't know what will make heaven rejoice and jubilate because of us. We were in our ignorance. We lived in ignorance. We spoke in ignorance. We acted in ignorance. We moved in ignorance. We decided in ignorance. We were ignorant of the word of God. We were ignorant of the truth as it is in Christ. We were ignorant of the demand of God and the way to enter into heaven. We were ignorant on how a child of God ought to behave. But now it says, as obedient children. It says now we have come into the family of God. And we ought to know what is the demand upon us as a member of the spiritual family. And actually, when you become born again, and you come into this spiritual family of God, it is what God wants. It is what is obtainable, acceptable in the spiritual family of God that becomes important unto you as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former laws in your ignorance. Very clearly it's telling us that if we have come into the kingdom of God, if we have become members of the family of God, the life we live now will be different from the life we used to live. That's why it says, you do not fashion yourself. You do not model yourself. You do not follow the example of your former way of living. Verse 15. But as he which has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Now, you'll hear people say, and this is right, that God says, Jesus says, it is not man that says, it is not church that says, it is not denomination that saves. It is not religion that saves. It's God who has called us. But then it says, as he which has called you is holy. So be ye holy. In all manner of conversation, which means whatever denomination we belong to, whatever church we fellowship with, whatever ministry or group we claim to be ours, and whatever locality we may be living in, if it is God who has called us into Christ, and we're living in Christ, whatever the denomination, whatever the church assembly, whatever the location where we are, as he which has called us is holy. It's not the church that called you. The local church may not be holy. That's not the one that called you. As God who has called you is holy. It is not the denomination that called you into the kingdom of God. It is God that called you as he which has called you is holy. So be ye holy in all manner of conversation because it is written. And what is written cannot be changed. It is written. And what is written is inspired of God. It is written. And what is written cannot be broken because it is written. And what is written will go beyond this world and come face to face with every human being on the day of judgment. It is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. God demands holiness. We're going to look at three points to help ourselves study the word of God, learn the word of God, and see what God really wants in our lives. Point one, God command on holiness. God command concerning holiness. Point number two, inward and outward holiness. Point three, requirement for entry into heaven. Number one, God command on holiness. Let's go back to the Pentateuch. We're looking at Leviticus chapter 11. Leviticus chapter 11. From verse 44. For I am the Lord your God. Ye shall therefore sanctify yourselves, and ye shall be holy, for I am holy. Neither shall ye defile yourselves with any manner of creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. 
for I the Lord that bringeth you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. Ye shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. Here we see that God himself spoke to the people that he had brought out of Egypt. And the Lord is speaking directly today to the people that he has brought out of the world. The people of God. Those who have been called out of the world. Those who have been called to turn out, turn away from sin. Those who have repented. Those who have left their former deeds, their former conversation, their former manner of life. Those who have come into the Lord Jesus Christ and they have become born again. The Lord spoke to the children of Israel. He used Moses, but the words were not the words of Moses. He spoke through Moses, but the doctrine was not the doctrine of Moses. That's why the Lord started in verse 44, he said, For I am the Lord your God. And the Lord is speaking to us today, and this message of holiness is not the message of man. It's not the message of a denomination. It's not the doctrine of a particular ministry. It is the doctrine, the message, the teaching, the word of God himself. For I am the Lord your God. Because of this he said, ye shall be holy. He tells us, because he is holy. Like father, like child. Like redeemer, like the redeemed. Like the savior, like the sage. If we say we are redeemed, we should live like the redeemer. If we say we are saved, we shall be like the Savior. If we say we have become the children of God, we shall be followers of God as their children. It says, Be ye holy, because I am holy. Then in verse 44, it said, Neither shall ye defile yourselves with any manner of creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Notice here, God created those creeping things. And yet it said, He had a purpose for creating them. And the purpose of creating them is not for you to defile yourself with them. You see many people, they reason in the negative way, in their own way. And they say, I can use that thing anywhere I want. After all, God created a Oh yes, he did. He created the trees, but it's not for you to worship the trees and make them your gods. He created iron and gold. It's not for you to make an idol out of out of eye, out of a gold, out of iron. He created all those plants and all those leaves. It's not for you to take those things and make charms out of them and kill your neighbor and destroy people out of them. He created the animals. It is not for you to use those animals to destroy your neighbor. He created them, but it is not for the purpose of defiling yourself. Some people say, after all, God created the tobacco. He created all those plants. Therefore, why can't I smoke them? If God created them, then they must be good for me to smoke. Not at all. He created them, but it is not for the purpose of destroying yourself, of defiling yourself, of ruining your own life and giving yourself incurable disease by smoking. Some people will say, after all, God made all these things that he used in making intoxicating wine. Oh yes? He did, but it's not for the purpose for you to destroy yourself, to become intoxicated, to become drunk. Therefore, he said, ye shall not defile yourself with any of these things that he has made. God has uh, provided money, but it's not for us to make money into an idol and be serving money and be worshipping money and be living for money alone. He wants us to live for God. And in verse 45, for I am the Lord that bringeth you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. Ye shall therefore, therefore, be holy, for I am holy. He said, because I saved you, because I redeemed you, because I called you out of Egypt, because I called you out of the world to become mine, you will find out what do I want, what do I desire, what do I cherish, what do I delight in, what are my commandments. What are my requirements? And then you will know that holiness is my number one priority in your life. He becomes the controller of your life. He becomes the leader, the captain that is leading you and guiding you to everything you ought to do, you have to do. And he tells us, be ye therefore holy, for I am holy. Let's look at Deuteronomy. 
chapter 23, verse 9 and verse 14. Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 9. When the host goeth forth against thine enemies, then keep thee from every wicked thing. You see, in our life in this world, there are times of joy, yet there are times of sorrow. There are times of pleasure, legitimate pleasure, and yet there are times of pain. There are times of hell, and yet there are times of sickness. There are times of birth, giving birth to children, new members of the family being born, times of success. There are times of failure. There are times when friends are so friendly. There are times when enemies are so violent. There are times when we have all things going our way. There are times when there are temptations and trials. And God told the children of Israel and said, When you go against thine enemies, when the day of problem arises, the day of conflict arises, the day of persecution may come. The day of struggling for life may even come. The day when enemies rise up against us. The day of trial. The day of temptation. The day of problem. The day of perplexity. He said, even at that time, you will keep yourself from every wicked thing. You see, there are people that do not know that it is at the time of problem. At the time of persecution, at the time of perplexity, at the time of trial, at the time of torment and torture, at the time of temptation, that we ought to be extra vigilant so that we we'll remain holy unto the Lord. People don't know what problems arise in the church. Local church, city church, state church, national church. That at such a time, it's when we shall watch over ourselves and keep ourselves from every wicked utterance. Keep ourselves from every wicked action. Keep ourselves from every wicked decision. Keep ourselves from every wicked proposal. Ye shall keep yourselves from every wicked thing. Verse 14. For the Lord thy God walketh in the midst of thy camp to deliver thee and to give up thine enemies before thee. Therefore shalt thy camp be holy, that is see no unclean thing in thee, and turn away from thee. Some of us are so careless, that maybe there is a problem in the district, a problem in the church, a problem with brother so and so, or sister so and so. And when there are problems like that, we do not remain vigilant over our soul, over our heart, over our mind. We indulge ourselves in things that we were not doing before, in conversations we were not having before, in the actions we were not uh, putting forth before, because there are problems in this area, problems in that area, we turn loose. We become, we have loose tongues, loose minds, loose eyes, loose ears, and we just yield ourselves so every kind of temptation that comes along. But the Lord is telling us, He says, even when the enemies are near, when you are in the very midst of the enemy, trials, trouble, temptation, a lot of enticement, a lot of people grumbling, gossiping, backbiting, doing things that are not right, it is at such a time you need to be on your guard. It is at such a time you ought to be holy unto the Lord. Take yourself as an individual. In your place of work, there may be problems, and people will want to oppress you, deny you of your life, and people may be torturing, tormenting you. And it is at such a time you should be holy unto the Lord, and be vigilant on yourself, so that you do not do, you do not say anything that is wrong in the sight of God. It may be that you are in the family, marriage, and yet there is a problem. Your wife is not giving you a breathing space. You are unhappy. You are sorrowful. Or it is that there is no child. And they say that the problem particularly is with you. And such a time is when people, because of their problem, peculiar problem, they do not remember that when the enemies are near, 
when the trials are much, and when it appears that temptations are just pressurizing them, they do not know that is the time to be vigilant on ourselves and to be holy unto the Lord. It may be that you lose your job. Maybe that you have lost your friend. Maybe that in the church some people misunderstand you. And they set themselves up in a gang, in a group of people to be throwing words at you, like throwing arrows at you at such a time. It's when we ought to guard ourselves, to be very careful, to be very vigilant, to ask more help, more grace of the Lord, that will remain holy, righteous unto the Lord. Look at it again, verse 14. For the Lord thy God walketh in the midst of thy camp to deliver thee and to give up thine enemies before thee. Therefore, therefore shall thy camp be holy. What did he mean by the camp there? They were camping to fight against the enemy nations against them. And he said, while you are in that camp, in the camp for battle, in the camp of struggle, in the camp of wanting to keep your territory so that the enemy nations will not take the territory away from you, he said, at such a time and in such a camp, you will be holy so that you see no unclean thing in thee, no unclean language in your mouth, no unclean thoughts coming from you, no unclean desires interchange, no unclean ambition plunge, no unclean action that is put forth, and you will not say, okay, that is what they are planning against me, I will plan this against them. Let's be very careful, let's be very careful. Holiness is an important experience we ought to have. And the Lord is calling upon every one of us that even in the most difficult of all times, even in the darkest of all nights, even in the most terrible of all situations, we will remember we ought to be holy unto the Lord. Romans chapter 12, from verse 1. Romans 12, verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Here Paul the Apostle tells us the extent, the scope, the depth, the height of service unto the Lord. You know there are people that think that when we come to church, and we're singing, and we're praying, and we're reading the Bible, and we're teaching other people, that that's the only time we're serving the Lord. Other people think, when we stand up at the house fellowship, and we're able to teach other people, and we're able to handle the prayer requests, and we're able to help other people directly by a particular act of worship, act of service, that's the time we're serving the Lord. But then, here Paul the Apostle, by the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, he tells us that service goes far beyond those limited areas we're thinking about. He said, when you present your bodies unto God, and you say, O oh God, I have come unto you, not only for my soul to be saved, not only for my mind to be renewed, not only for my spirit to be given unto you and to be joined unto the Lord and become one spirit with the Lord. Not only that, but when you present your body unto the Lord, that then it becomes a living sacrifice. You know, sacrifice in the Old Testament is what to take away from the flock and then you present it unto God and then you do with it as God has commanded. Only what God has commanded. When you become a Christian, when you become a believer, you realize that you have to present your body, your, your whole body, hand, eye, ear, mouth and tongue, thoughts, brain, strength, bones, everything, hand and leg, everything, the total body, you present unto God as a sacrifice. And yet, not a dead sacrifice like the Old Testament sacrifice, a living sacrifice. Why is it a living sacrifice? Because every day, every time the sun rises, you say, Lord, I present this body to you again. That this sun will never do anything contrary to your will. This mouth will never say anything contrary to your will. 
And this heart of mine will never think anything, plan anything, meditate anything, contrary to your word. And this brain of mine will never study anything, anything that is contrary to your perfect will. These eyes of mine will not be set on anything, will not gaze on anything, look on anything that is contrary to your word, contrary to your will. These legs of mine will never walk to any place, will never go to any place, contrary to your will. This strength of mine will never be used for anything, contrary to your, for your purpose in life for myself. That's the living sacrifice. Living sacrifice. You present your body, a living sacrifice, and then it says, holy. Holy. That means, you become holy unto the Lord. Hands will not steal. Legs will not do anything that is contrary to the will of God. Like walking into a place where they are worshipping idols. Like walking into a place where they are getting drunk. Eyes will never look at anything that will pollute your mind, that will make you and not to be able to pray, that will confuse your mind, pollute your mind, defile your mind. And it means that you just present yourself completely unto the Lord, to be holy unto the Lord. It says, that is your service. It says, that is your reasonable service. Verse 2. And be not conformed to this world. Be not conformed to the systems of this world. Be not conformed to the customs of this world. Be not conformed to the traditions of this world. Be not conformed to the ways of this world. Be not conformed to the ideologies of this world. Be not conformed to all the cheating, all the corruption, all the lifestyle of this world. Be not conformed unto this world, but be ye transformed by the renewal of your mind. You notice that? Not by the removal of your mind. God will not remove your mind. Your mind is still there. But He only wants that mind to be renewed. He wants that mind to be renovated. He wants that mind to be cleansed, to be cleaned up, so that now you will think new thoughts. You will plan new plans. And you will study new things. It says, by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Very clearly from the word of God, God commands us to be holy. Already I've read unto you, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 14 to 16. And it's telling us there very clearly, as obedient children, not fashioning ourselves to the former laws in our ignorance. But then he says, As he which has called you is holy, be ye holy, for I am holy, uh, for because I am holy. It says, We must be holy. Let's go to point two. What kind of holiness are we really talking about? What kind of holiness is the word of God talking about? Telling us this is the holiness demanded of us by God. According to this point and according to scripture, it is inward and outward holiness. Inward and outward holiness. There are sometimes you will find some people that will say it doesn't matter what they do outwardly. It doesn't matter how they act outwardly. It doesn't matter how they dress outwardly. It doesn't matter how they behave outwardly. That all that the Lord is looking for is inward holiness. Those people are wrong. Those people are wrong. He wants us to be inwardly holy and outwardly holy. Other people, on the other hand, will say that once they are all right without, all right outwardly, it doesn't matter what they are thinking inside what they are planning inside, what they are designing inside. It doesn't matter what they are entertaining, embracing on the inside of them. No, God wants us to be inwardly holy and outwardly holy. In Psalm 24, Psalm 24, verses 3 and 4, Who shall ascend unto the hill, into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that has clean hands outwardly, and a pure heart inwardly. He that has clean hands, what does it mean clean hands? Clean hands that will not touch an idol. Clean hands that will not embrace an idol. Clean hands that will not pick up an idol. Clean hands that will not outwardly worship idol. Clean hands, oh yes, clean hands that will not raise up that hand to slap the father or the mother, that will honor the father and the mother, that will not do anything externally, 
anything outwardly that will injure the parent, disrespect the parent, insult the parent. What does he mean by clean hands? Clean hands, that is the hand that will not steal what belongs to another person. He will not pick up another person's money, another person's property, and make that property his own when he has not been given. What does it mean by clean hands? Clean hands that will not hold somebody else's wife to commit adultery with her. So the clean hands that will not hold another person's husband to commit adultery with him. It is clean hand that will not hold another person's daughter to commit fornication with her. Or that will not hold a, a young man to commit fornication with him. Clean hand. It is clean hand that will not take a gun or take a knife or take a cutlass and kill anybody. Clean hand. Clean hand that will not take any chemical and swallow it and kill the innocent baby inwardly. Clean hands, clean hands that will not commit any outward sin. Clean hands, the, the clean hands that will behave and conduct itself according to the will of God, according to the word of God, outwardly. God requires outward holiness, but not only that, and a pure heart. Pure heart, that is the heart that will not inwardly entertain any evil thought. The inward thought will not be of the sin that is evil that is planning wickedness, that is pure heart that will not be hiding hatred inside that heart. It is not somebody that is smiling on the outside and yet is hiding and nursing and entertaining hatred and bitterness and revenge and uh, evil sin in their heart. No pure heart, a heart that is cleansed, a heart that is purified, a heart that is not covetous, is talking about a heart that is free from covetousness, that is free from evil desire, that is free from evil ambition, that is free from inward dream that is evil. It is telling us that this person that we are talking about, having pure heart, he will not embrace anything within, turn anything within, entertain anything within, run after anything within, accommodate anything within, that is evil. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? He that has clean hands outwardly, and a pure heart inwardly, who has not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. You see, the Lord requires holiness within, holiness without. Is this possible? Can a person live a holy life, a righteous life within and without? Holy life in the private, holy life in the public? Holy life in the midst of the crowd, holy life when it's alone, holy life when it is daylight, holy life when it is dark, holy life behind the curtain, holy life outside the door. Can a person live holy, act holy, move holy, walk holy, decide holy, do everything that is holiness unto the Lord in this world? Let's see, in First Thessalonians chapter 2. First Thessalonians chapter 2. Verse 10, ye are witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we have behaved ourselves among you that believe. See here Paul the Apostle, calling God to witness, and calling the people to witness that he has lived with his team holy and just and unblameable. Now, as to examine this verse of scripture, you will see, number one, it says, Ye are witnesses of our outward behavior, outward conduct, outward lifestyle. You see everything we do. You see the words coming out of our mouth. You see the places we go. You see the way we dress. You see the way we eat. You see the way we interact with the opposite sex. You see the way we interact with other people's wives. You see the way we interact with the believers. You see the way we interact with unbelievers. You watch us during the day. You see everything that we do outwardly. Ye are witnesses how holily we have behaved outwardly. How justly we have behaved externally. How unblameably we have behaved in public. We have behaved ourselves among you that believe. Then he said God also is witness that the inward desire that you cannot see, God can see, and he has looked on us at us inwardly, and he knows that inwardly we are holy, inwardly we are just, inwardly we are unblameable. You see that it is possible to have 
outward life that is holy, that is righteous, that is unblameable, that has and no blame, no spot, no wrinkle, that is completely holy unto the Lord, and inwardly to be holy, inwardly to be holy, inwardly in the thought, in the mind, in the soul, in the spirit, in the desire, inwardly in the inner man to be holy unto the Lord, as ye know. That's verse 11. How we exalted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his children that ye would walk worthy of God who has called you unto his kingdom and glory. He said, we have done it by the grace of God. You too should do it by that same grace of God. He said, they have behaved holy, just, unblameable in their sight and in the sight of God. And he was calling upon them that they too shall walk in that newness of life. In Luke chapter 1, verses 74 and 75, inward and outward holiness, that he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our lives. This is the way to keep holiness of life. If you have fear, you will not be able to live a holy life. If you as a woman, you fear what that man might do, what that man may withdraw from you. If you do not submit yourself unto him, you are living in fear, you will not be able to live a holy life. If you are fearful in your place of work, that if you don't cringe, if you don't compromise, if you don't lower the standard a little, you may miss your promotion. You may even miss some things coming unto you. Because of that fear, you will not be able to live a holy life. If in your community where you are living, they want to do something that is evil, and they have always been talking negative against you, and they have always been passing negative comments on you, if you are afraid of their comments, afraid of what they are going to say against you, you are not going to be able to live a holy life. If when you go to the village, then they call you into their midst and they say, we have heard of you, that uh, you have joined a particular church and now you are carrying Bible. Now you want to obey the whole Bible and if you do, they are going to persecute you. If you are afraid of their persecution, afraid of the, 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 uh, the, the facial expression that they are, with which they are looking at you, you will not be able to live a holy life. But it says that it will grant unto us that we have been delivered out of the hands of our enemies might serve him without fear. If you fear that somebody is going to take some money away from you, somebody is going to cheat you, or somebody is not going to give you the position that maybe you want in the church, if you fear that if I don't pretend, if I'm not hypocritical, they will not allow me to do this which I want to do, if I don't lower the standard and change the doctrine, they will not give me opportunities which I want in that place and in this place, living in that fear, you will not be able to live a holy life. But it is when you are without fear. You don't care what anybody says about you, what anybody thinks about you, what anybody plans against you. You don't care even if they try to take away from you what rightfully belongs unto you. Because Jesus Christ has said, fear not the man that is able to kill the body, and after that he has not else that he can do. But fear him who is able to kill the body and destroy the soul in hell. And I say unto you, he said, fear him. You fear God alone. You do not have any fear of man that brings a snare. If you are fearing people, fearing husbands, fearing wives, fearing parents, fearing children, fearing neighbors, fearing even church members, fearing persecutors, fearing uh, that you lose money, fearing that this may happen, that may happen, fearing idol worshippers, fearing your relatives, you will not be able to live a holy life. But that we should serve him without fear. Verse 75, in holiness and righteousness before him. That's in what holiness. In holiness and righteousness before him. That's in what holiness. All the days of our life. You don't care what people say about you. What comments they pass against your life. You decide you want to be holy unto the Lord. That's how to remain holy unto the Lord. Let's go to the first point. Requirements for entry into heaven. Before we can get to heaven, here is what is very important in our lives. Very, very important in our lives. In fact, if you have everything else and you don't have holiness, you will not be able to see the Lord on the last day. You have gifts, you have talent, you have ability, you have position, 
you have privilege, you have employment, you have certificate, you have everything that the world can think about except holiness. Except holiness. And the people of the world are lifting you up. And they are blowing your trumpet. And they are praising you. And they are glorifying you. And they are telling how great you are, how wonderful you are. But you are not inwardly holy. Your heart is defiled. Your heart is dirty. And they are saying that you are the most useful person in church and outside church. And you are using your gift to be a blessing to this, a blessing to that. You are on demand everywhere. They are calling you in this place. They are calling you in that place. And they are calling you that you will do something for them. You will grant them a favor. You will use your talent for them. They are calling you everywhere. And everybody is, they are even ever jealous of you. And they are saying so and so is demanded everywhere. It's the one everybody is looking for because it's the most respected. It's the most honored. Because of the things you have, you have a lot of things except holiness. Except holiness. Even in the church, you may have gifts. Gifts of the spirit. Gifts of the natural life. Charisma. Ability. Opportunity. Privilege. Position. Usefulness. Money. Think about it. Family. Children, beautiful children, beautiful wives, handsome husbands, popular husbands. You have everything that you can think about except holiness. Except holiness. If a person does not have holiness, holiness of heart, holiness of life, holiness within and without, no matter what else we possess, we will not be able to see the Lord. No matter what else we possess. Look at it in Hebrews chapter 12 verse 14. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 14. Follow peace with all men. And holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. This verse alone. This verse alone. If you understand it. If you allow the Spirit of God to interpret it to your heart. And to make you understand the requirements of God. The only thing, the important thing, the essential thing, the total thing that God is expecting from you before He will allow you to enter into heaven. For the peace with all men. Think about your job, your locality here. And think about the different kinds of people that are there. Rude people, shockingly rude. Disrespectful people that will insult anybody, any minute. And people that are immature, people that are not wise, something to are surrounded by angry people, gossiping people. And the tendency for you, because they gossip against you, is to fight back. If you want to get to heaven, follow peace with all men. Look at your family. And look at the things that your wife will do, that will just almost annoy anybody. Look at the things that your husband will do that will almost annoy anybody. And yet it says, follow peace with all men. Think about your in-laws. The things they say, the things they do, that will just make a person to be set on edge. Think about the people that will just want to do everything to make you nervous and to make you angry. Yet it says, if you want to get to heaven, if you want to keep your relationship and standing with the Lord, follow peace with all men. Uh, look at the workers in the church. Look at the members in the church. Sometimes some people do things that a just thing keeps you in the wrong place. They just step on the people where you have your most painful soul. And the same thing that will get into your marrow, get into your bone, get into your mind, it will be like a dagger in the heart. There are some people that do that. And yet, Follow peace with all men. There are some people that all that you have been doing all these years, they will want to turn it upside down, just destroy it and scatter it. And they want to show their hatred for you. Their facial expression will show it. Their words will show it. Their aggressiveness will show it. They are angry. And they want to just open all their fire upon you. And yet it says, follow peace with all men. Sometimes it's a child, a child that is son in the flesh. And this child, the way he talks, the way he behaves, the way he acts towards everybody at home, 
the way he takes the property in the family and he goes to sell. And the Bible says, follow peace with all men. What am I going to say about that boss that never wants to see you? What am I going to say about those jealous co-workers that never want, to make, uh, want you to have any progress? What am I going to say about that same woman in the house you are living that doesn't want to see you cook in the same, in the same uh, uh, kitchen with her? What am I going to say about the people that gather their chairs to, together in the evening every day and you are the topic of their conversation? Follow peace with all men. What are we going to say? about the people that have injured you, offended you, and they will never make restitution. They will never say sorry. They will never come back to you. What are you going to do? Are you going to say until they come back and make restitution, I'm not going to forgive them? You want to get to heaven? Heaven, the place where God dwells. Heaven, the place where the angels are crying, holy, 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 day and night. The place where Christ, the Savior, the Redeemer, where He is enthroned. The place where the streets are gold. The place where it says in my Father's house there are many mansions. The place where they are singing hallelujah chorus every time. The place where there is no earth. The place where there is no problem. The place where there are no tears. The place where there is no sickness. The place where there is no death. The place where there is no cause. And all the cause has passed away forever and ever. You want to get to heaven? Ah, you cannot say until that man comes and makes restitution to me. I will not forgive. Follow peace with all men. Have you seen people that are younger than yourself? When we talk about they do not have anything as much as you have. They do not have knowledge, they do not have property, they do not have education, they do not have certificates, they do not have position as much as you have. And yet they will insult you. And yet they will knock you. And yet even to your own face, they will do things you, you said, can anybody do this to me as high as I am, as privileged as I am? What are you going to do if you want to get to heaven? Can you fight? Can you quarrel against them? Can you have animosity against them? Can you hold malice against them? Can you struggle with them? Can you throw anything at them? Can you uh, do anything that will make them, other people, to insult them? Can you abuse them? You cannot. Follow peace. All men. All men. Everywhere. Every time. If you want to get to heaven, tell us this. And you see, heaven is so precious. Heaven is so high. Heaven is so holy. Heaven is so good and great. Heaven is a place that we are all designed to go. And this is the way to get there. Follow peace with all men and holiness. Can I tell you this? That sin of the flesh can take you from heaven and take heaven away from you. Just a transitory, passing kind of pleasure that you have now and forget in a few minutes time. That sin can take heaven, eternity. Many years, millions of years, billions of years, millions and billions and billions of years, it can take the everlasting enjoyment in heaven, everlasting pleasure in heaven, it can take it away from you just because of that little sin. Why do you want to commit sin? Why do you want to be unholy? Why do you want to have any evil, any sin, anything that is defiling in your heart, in your mind, in your disposition? Why do you want to have anything that is ungodly, unchristlike in your life? Don't you want to get to heaven? Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Rise up and talk to the Lord and say, Lord, that heaven I'll be there. That heaven I'll be there. And when the devil is fighting to the nail, so that I do not get there, I am going to get there. I know that the evil spirits and demons are fighting. They are trying to irritate me. They are trying to annoy me. They are trying to infuriate. And they are trying to just destabilize and destroy so that I don't make it, but that heaven I'll make it. I know the devil is trying to multiply enemies. Multiply with power. Multiply the people that are, that are gossiping so that they will do things against me that I will retaliate, but I will not, I will not, I'm going to make that heaven. I know the devil is multiplying temptation, multiplying trial, multiplying problem, multiplying all my, all my uh, complexities and perplexities and anxieties, so that I will, I will just get this courage and give it up, but I'm not going to give it up, not for anything, not for anything. That heaven, I want to make it. Why don't you rise up and 
and say, Lord, I will make it. Lord, I will make it. Lord, I will make it. And you pray unto the Lord and say, Lord, help me. Lord, help me. And I follow peace with all men. Oh, yes, some men are difficult. Some women are difficult. You want to make peace with them? They are all for trouble. They are all for you. They are all for you. Or throw you stones at you. But Lord, I'll be at peace with them. It's just for a short time. It's just for a short time. It's just for this period of time. Whatever they do to me, they knock me, they trample upon me. Whatever they do, I'll make peace with all men so that that heaven I'll be there. I'll be there. Abraham has got there. Oh yes, they have got there. David has got there, that man has got there. the apostles have got there, that man has fire. And all those so-called prophets and people of God of God, they have got there. They have trouble. Ah, this is my own time. This is my own time. It's been over for them. It will soon be over for me. This time of trouble, it will soon be over. The time of trial, it will soon be over. The time of temptation, it will soon be over. All these problems of public speaking, they will soon be over. And all the gossip against your life, they will soon be over. All the poverty and hunger, they will soon be over. Are you safe? It will soon be over. And in this world, world of torment, world where the devil is running to and fro, wanting to destabilize everyone and to, to make you just give up the faith, it will soon be over. This world where even if people, small young people with familiar spirits, will try to torment innocent people, it will soon be over. World of poverty, world of problems. It will soon be over. Why don't you pray and say, God, this short time I will endure. This short time I will be at peace. I will not allow anyone to take this heaven. This is the most precious thing I have that God said He will give me. What can I compare with heaven? What can I compare with heaven? Is it wife? Is it husband? Is it children? Is it anything on earth? Is it job? Is it position? Is it popularity? Is it fame? Is it opportunity? What can I compare with heaven? Don't let anything. Don't let anyone. Don't let any situation. Don't let any circumstance take heaven away from you. Follow peace with all men and holiness. That which no man shall do the Lord. Pray, the Lord will help you. He knows the one to make you. He knows the one to get to heaven. He knows what you are going to and he's able to help you. He says, my grace is sufficient for you. My grace is sufficient for you. Lean upon the Lord. Hold on to the Lord. Embrace the Lord. And say, Lord, I am weak for your action. I will not let you go. I want you. I want help. I want your grace. I will not let you go. Jesus, help me. They will help you. They will help you. And it will come over them to the it will soon be over. The time will soon be off. The trumpet will soon sound. Follow peace with all men. Without which, no man shall stay alone. 